give you glory and honor. Thank you, Lord. We thank you. You are the one that seals us up. You are the one that comforts us. More than any man can do. More than our own skills and abilities can do. More than our jobs and what we find pleasure in can do. Do a deep work within our hearts. In the name of Jesus, we give you glory this morning. In Jesus' name, Holy Spirit, move among us. Heal the brokenhearted. Men that which is broken and torn apart. In the name of Jesus Christ, we open up to you, Lord. We open up for a revival, for a resurgence, for a purging. In the name of Jesus Christ, we give you glory. In Jesus' precious name, speak through me in this morning. Anoint my lips and let the word come unhindered. I pray that the word will not fall on stony grounds. In the name of Jesus, it will not fall by the wayside. In the name of Jesus, and the curse of this world shall not choke the word. In the name of Jesus, but it shall yield fruit. It shall bring impact. All the seeds of the words and the sermons that we have been sowing, we declare that it begins to manifest and bear fruit in the heart and the life of these people. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Jam your hands together for Jesus. Are you excited to be here today? Hallelujah. Amen and amen. Oh, glory. As Christians, we can be happy in the club. We can be happy uh, at the football field. I was, I was talking to an Uber driver, and we were talking about football. I said, nowadays, when you hear people arguing about a football match, or you see somebody crying, it's not because his or her team lost. It's because the bet didn't go well. So you don't see real passion for football nowadays. Uh, gambling has taken over, so you, don't, you can't see. Everything is, as Allah said on Wednesday, that everything is fighting our faith. It's fighting our spiritual life. It's fighting our prayer lives. So you have to be determined. You have to be conscious of how you want to live in these perilous times. Hallelujah. What we are seeing, Jesus said, they will hate you for my name's sake. You are not going to be hated or fought against because maybe you work in a bank or you work uh, for a certain oil company. There will come persecutions or one, one way or the other for what you are doing, but what the world will hate you for is the name of Jesus. So in Acts chapter 5, they told them, don't preach this name again to bring the guilt and the blood of this man upon us. So what the Sanhedrins and the Pharisees feared was the name of Jesus. What the enemy fears is that name. And I say that before Jesus died, he was called Jesus. When they gave birth to him, his name was Jesus. When he was a carpenter roaming through the streets of Jerusalem, he was what? Jesus. He was a carpenter. But it was after he resurrected on the third day and defeated Satan, then God created authority to his name. And he said, at the name of Jesus. So when you call that Jesus in Spain, devils will not bow. But the one you know, the one that you have received by revelation, which is inside you, the devil knows when you are calling the name of Jesus with authority or with assurance, when you mention and there's no assurance in it, he knows. Hallelujah. Glory to Jesus. That's just by the way to stir up the waters. Today when I was praying, man of God, I saw a very big balloon full of water. I've never seen that before. And I was asking the Holy Spirit what it means. And he said, this thing is about to burst. It's my spirit. So we are readying ourselves for the what? The coming awakening. And I, I want you to open up your spirit for what God is doing in the season. We are the children of what? The spirit. We are people who has the Holy Ghost in us. And God is about to do a new thing. Revival is going to sweep across the world. Wherever you are, open up your spirit. Open up your spirit. I'm not saying that because of the sermon or what we have been preaching here. But a new thing is about to begin in the body of Christ. Hallelujah. Glory to Jesus. 
So we heard about readying for the coming resurgence, how those that God will use, the, their traits and the characteristics that they carry. And then we also moved on to hear um, an enlightened people for what? A resurgence by Pastor Lord. And the third one was what? A wedded people for a resurgence. Oh, you are not preaching with me. So it means that you are forgotten all the sermons. Hallelujah. Yes, also Kevin was preaching with me, so he knows. Hallelujah. God bless you. And the fourth part is what? An anointed people for the resurgence. Let me say this. He doesn't want me to say, but it is his notes. But the Lord was going to preach this one, but I have collected the notes, so I'm preaching it verbatim. I didn't, I didn't change anything, but maybe what I will say, if I give the notes to Edwina, the way and manner in which she will communicate is different from the way I will communicate. And if I give it to Pastor Lord, the way he will communicate is different from the way I will communicate. It, de it depends on the manner and the spirit. Some are charismatic, some are... I know what... <laughs> Hallelujah. Isaiah chapter 61. Let's enter into the word. Glory to Jesus. I will not read my old King James... I am a student of all King James, so I always read that one. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. Somebody say good tidings. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captive. Somebody say proclaim liberty. And the opening of the prison to those who are bound. First of all, I want us to acknowledge our brothers and sisters who are in IJM doing the work of God, snatching people from what? The slavery. Hallelujah. This is a clear scripture. It says what? The open prison. We are seated here, but we don't even know that some kids are what? Under slavery. They, 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 they use them on the, 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 the waters for this kind of work. And it's, it's a very, very sensitive work. And if, if the owners of you know, the enemy is in such a way that when he knows that God has delivered you or Christ has delivered you, he still hangs around you to test to see whether you have really been delivered. So if I'm a slave master and I know that my worker, servant, slave has been delivered from my hand, you the one that delivered him or her, I have to come after you. Hallelujah. So we need prayers for, or they need prayer. So always remember them in prayers. So he says, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. Next verse. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. To comfort all who mourn. We are not preaching vengeance now. What we are preaching now is reconciliation. Hallelujah. To console those who mourn in Zion. To give them beauty for ashes. The oil of joy for mourning. The garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. That they may be called trees of righteousness. The planting of the Lord. That he may be what? Glorified. Next verse. And they shall what? Rebuild the old ruins. They shall raise up the former desolations and they shall repair the ruined cities, the desolation of many generations. So those that when you preach the good tidings, they hear it and they are delivered from the prison. This is what they go into effect or this is the resultant effect. They begin to go into their communities, into their families, into their society and in the country to begin to what? Build the old ruins. And they what? Raise up the former desolation, that which was broken. And they repair what? Real cities and the desolation of many generations. Next verse. Strangers shall stand and feed your flock. And the sons of the foreigner shall be your plowmen and your vine dressers. Let's go to verse 9. Let's go to verse 9. Okay, let me read the verse 6. I think it's in my notes. It's part of the notes. Their descendants shall be known, but... But you shall be named the priest of the Lord. They shall call you the servants of our God. You shall eat the riches of the Gentiles. And in their glory you shall what? Boast. Verse 9. Hallelujah. Their descendants shall be known among the Gentiles. And their offspring among the people. All who see them shall acknowledge them. That they are the posterity whom the Lord has blessed. Glory to Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Here ends the reading of the word. <laughs> he didn't go to Presby. <laughs> hallelujah. 
So those that God will be using are a people of the spirit. The difference between you and Saddam Hussein is that you have the spirit he doesn't have. He can have all that is in the world. But what God can use you for, he can't use him for. There is a limit to which God can use an unbeliever. But to the one who is born again, there is no limit. When I was doing my thesis, I wrote, I had to defend, does God hear the prayer of unbelievers? <laughs> Hallelujah. You see it in the Bible. Whenever God heard the prayer of, God heard prayers of unbelievers, it is towards salvation. But you, God hears your prayers always. Prophets know they her head. It means that I did a correct job. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Whenever God heard an unbeliever, somebody that cried upon, that's why I said the other time that when somebody said the God of, uh, what do you call it, Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, it means that the person doesn't know this God. That's why he's referring to this God. So when somebody says the God of Lord Alote, it means an unbeliever is trying to know your God but doesn't know your God. That's why he's saying the God of Lord Alote. But when you become born again, you are a, a, a child of God. So now you can now say Christ Jesus. You now have easy access, clear route into the presence of God. You don't now need this man to enter into the presence of God for you. You have access. Hallelujah. And you have to be filled with the Spirit. It is by us feeling or getting filled with the Spirit. Listen to me. There is a Spirit that comes within us. That is, that one you don't see with your physical eye when you receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. Because he's the one that regenerates you. When somebody says, I accept Christ as my Lord and Savior, it's an automatic work unseen by your physical eye. And it takes effect. So the fact that somebody is not speaking in tongues, which is an evidence of manifestation of the spirit, does not mean the person is not born again. The person is saved. But it goes further. Where the person begins to... Okay, let me use your bag as an example. I'm not digressing, but just an example. This is the Holy Spirit. This bag is full of items. It's full of gifts. It's full of many things. So this is the Holy Spirit. So once I receive Christ as my Lord and Savior... The Holy Spirit comes within me. But when I begin to search and understand by Scripture and the Word of God, I begin to open the back. Then I realize that there is a phone. There is, okay, I will say, <laughs> hallelujah. So within the Holy Ghost, there are many things within the Holy Ghost. And until your eyes are open with understanding and clarity, you can't tap into it. That's why some people can be, the, your mother or grandfather or grandmother that lived in the 1700s or 1800s that received Christ or was saved and didn't speak in tongues does not mean he or she is not in heaven. Sometimes charismatic will say because you are not speaking in tongues, it means that you are not born again. But that is not it. As the Lord taught us and it is very clear. But what I want you to understand is that first of all, you need regeneration in your heart. You need to be filled with the Spirit. You need to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior. Now you qualify for God to use you. You qualify to be part of the people that God wants to use. Hallelujah. And after you have received the Spirit, now there is what we call the Spirit upon. It comes upon you for the purpose of the assignment that God has for you. So, at your workplace, you are a witness. If you are a banker, God gave you the job as a means for you to what? Evangelize. That is your mission field. If you are what? A politician. It is just a tool or a way by which God wants you to communicate his mind to people. So wherever you stand as a child of God or believer or Christian, you are a witness. If you are singing, you are a witness. If you are a preacher, you are a witness. If you are without a microphone, you are a witness. If you are a student, you are a witness. Wherever you go, you are a witness. Whatever work you are doing, you are a witness. But you can't do this work effectively outside of the Spirit. You need a Spirit to come upon you. Hallelujah. So for us to receive or for us to see revival in the nation, or first of all, let me say, in our families, in our community, in our society, and then the nation as a whole and the world, it has to begin with us. 
It has to begin with you. It has to begin with me. And after we have received the spirit, we are regenerated and he comes upon us mightily. We begin to affect. We begin to move into our community and people begin to see the effect of what? The spirit that came upon us. Hallelujah. So, we need the spirit as Jesus was. Acts chapter 10 verse 38. We need a spirit as Jesus was. Jesus, who was he? He was God in flesh. Or God who has what? Come in human flesh. And the Bible says in Acts 1, Acts chapter 10 verse 38 that how God anointed what? Jesus of Nazareth. Somebody say of Nazareth. He didn't say Jesus of heaven. I said also that he said, Jesus, your presence is heaven to me. Jesus, you are going to heaven not because Abraham is there. You are going to heaven because Jesus is there. Even before he died, all of them were in a compartment in the place called paradise. And after he died, he took them into the place where he was going. So you go to heaven because Jesus is there. Heaven is heaven. If Jesus is not in heaven, that is not your location. Where he is, is where you are going. His presence is heaven to you. That is the meaning of the song. So wherever he is, is heaven. Wherever he is, that is where you go. So if Jesus is in hell, that's where we are all going. And when he enters into hell, light will appear there. When Jesus says that what I'm wearing is black, automatically it turns into black. So when he enters into hell with his light, that place becomes light. Hallelujah. So he was anointed with the spirit. If he was able to do what he did by the spirit, I cannot do what I want to do outside of that. I can't do outside of the spirit. I need the spirit to come upon me. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth. So how God has anointed Coco of what? Maybe, let me say, a shaman with the spirit. God uses people who are nobodies. I'll be reading certain things to you. Everybody that God used has a past. And they came from somewhere. And God picked them. So in Isaiah 51, he said, Consider or look unto your father Abraham. For I called him alone. Who was Abraham? A Syrian or from someone from Mesopotamia. And God delivered him from idol worship and said, I want to form a nation out of you. And then he formed a people and he called them what? Hebrews. And then they became a people. And then he called them his own. Now you are the Israel of God. I'm not saying you are the, you are an Israeli. I'm saying you are the Israel of God. We'll explain later. Hallelujah. You are the Israel of God. You are somebody that God has broken the partition and called you from your family into his own. In Obadiah, Obadiah chapter 1 verse 21, he said, In Mount Zion, saviors shall be raised. So as you are seated here, you are a savior to your family and to your generation. And how do you save your family outside of the spirit? Most of the times I realize that people that wanted to go and save their own people, they were dragged into them or dragged into what the family are suffering because they were not anointed. Hallelujah. If you are without the spirit, you can't walk with God and you can't work for God. It is by the spirit of God that we walk with God and work for God. Outside the spirit, you get what? Frustrated. Frustration will set in. But if you are full of the spirit, you can walk with God. So as you are seated here, you are a savior. Somebody say, I'm a savior. Give me that scripture, Obadiah 121. He says, in Mount Zion, because the Lord was teaching us Mount Zion when he was preaching about enlightening people for resurgence. He said, then saviors. Somebody say, saviors. This one is plural. He didn't say, the screen is broken, so it's not, uh, there's no comma there. It's S. Saviors shall come to what? Mount Zion to judge the mountains of Esau. And the kingdom shall be the Lord's. Hallelujah. So it means that it is not only one savior. He became a seed. When he became a seed, I say that when he was, before he died, he was called the only begotten of the father. And after he died and rose, he became the first begotten. So the first begotten means that he has what? Risen with a seed. Little Jesus. Now you are a savior. Somebody clap your hands for Jesus. So, God has sent you into your family. 
God has sent you back into your community. God is sending you back into your society. At the campus there, that's why I said you were a witness. In your family, you were a witness. In this country, the way things are so hard and everybody doesn't know. A friend of mine said, he sent me a text. He said, man of God, the way things are going, if you collect yourself, cry, you can't collect. <laughs> I said, what, that, what do you mean by that? <laughs> Hallelujah. But we have a word that says that things are going to be hard, but for us, there shall be an exemption. Hallelujah. So we hold on to the word of God that God has said there shall be an exemption. So I declare that that, that word come into manifestation for you. Whatever is your need, whatever is your request, your heart desire, may the Lord exempt you from the pressures in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. So God is saying that on Mount Zion, so now as we are seated here, we are part of the family of God in Mount Zion. We have come to the heavenly what? Jerusalem. So we have a physical Jerusalem and we have a heavenly Jerusalem. We have a physical Israel and we have the spiritual Israel. That's why I say you are the Israel of God. Hallelujah. So we have all come to Mount Zion and in Mount Zion, Savior shall be raised. So now that you are saved, you are a Savior. You need the empowerment of the Spirit to go back into your family. So you can have a security man who is not saved or who has not helped the gospel. Because you are a witness. You can't have a driver or sit in an Uber or boat and the person has not heard the gospel. You can't be in the campus, same hostel with someone who has not heard the gospel. You are a witness. Whatever you are doing or whatever platform God creates for you, whatever opportunity God gives you, whatever breakthrough God brings your way is a way for you to communicate to him. Why? What is God's heartbeat? The general will of God is for all men to be saved. But not everybody shall be saved because it's by choice. Some people will decide they will not receive after they have, re after they have heard. Hallelujah. So, but you, your assignment is still to what? Communicate. So you have to let people know about him. We are saviors. Hallelujah. Somebody say, I'm a savior. This is actually the reason why I added savior to my name. So, we saw that God had to anoint Jesus with the Holy Ghost and with what? Power. He was a child that was conceived by the Spirit. When they were baptizing him, or they were baptizing them, John the Baptist was baptizing people and he went there. The Bible says that he went praying and the heavens were open and a voice came. That means that the Holy Ghost came upon him like a dove. And then also, after the baptism, the Spirit led him into the wilderness for his temptations. So after the temptations, he came back in the power of the Spirit. And then what was the resultant effect? We saw that he went out what? Doing good. Healing all that were oppressed of the devil. But the first thing is that he was anointed. Somebody say anointed. So we see that we also, when Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 61, when Isaiah was proclaiming this word, he's saying that the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He was talking about the Messiah. It was a messianic prophecy. But it was also applicable to him. It was a ministry God had called him into. So most of the times, the promises of God had near manifestation or near meaning and then future manifestation. Most of the promises of God. So if God spoke something to Abraham and said that I'll make your seed or your, I'll make you blessed, I'll bless you, you will lend to nations. How many nations did Abraham lend to? I wouldn't see. Hallelujah. But that does not mean the prophecy didn't come to pass. So God can say to my sister that I'll make you this and that and that. Once God has spoken, he doesn't lie. Whatever he has said will surely come to pass, whether during her time or after her generations. Hallelujah. So God's word is for sure. Amen. So when God said, or Abraham, uh, what do you call it? Isaiah was speaking that the spirit of the Lord is, was upon me. He was talking about himself. The spirit is upon him to proclaim liberty to this and that and that. He was speaking the, the gospel or he was speaking what the spirit has come upon him for him to do. And it was also about the Messiah. And when the Messiah came, we saw in Acts 10, 38, how he was anointed by the Spirit and also went further to speak the gospel. 
Hallelujah. The word anoint means to consecrate. So it was the anointing that consecrated Christ into the messianic office, into the assignment that God had for him. Somebody say, I shall be anointed. Say, I receive the anointing in the name of Jesus Christ. It was the spirit that endowed Jesus with power and he went about doing good. Aren't you tired of the Christianity that, let me tell you something, God gave all of us dominion, men or man. And as believers, when you see somebody that is sick and you have compassion towards the person, the next thing you, you want to see is that the person comes out from their predicament. So it tells you that God has put something in you that you yourself, you have not realized. That is to help people come out from prison. To heal broken hearted. To, to what? Bring salvation and comfort them that are mourning. But you yourself, you have not realized. It is deep within you. But until you yield to the spirit, you can't see it. Hallelujah. So, he consecrated him. When we are saying anointing, I'm not talking about the physical oil. We use the oil as what? A medium for the spirit to move. Or the spirit to come upon people. Hallelujah. But what we are talking about is what? The Holy Spirit. The power of God coming upon men. Coming upon people. Hallelujah. When you read the Old Testament from Genesis to Malachi, what you will see is that you will never encounter or see in a place where the Bible says that the Spirit went or dwelled. Somebody was full of the Spirit or filled anybody. No. The Spirit is upon me. The Spirit came upon Samson. The Spirit came upon Gideon. The Spirit came upon David. The Spirit came upon Joseph. The Spirit came upon so and so. And they went about to defeat the enemies. Hallelujah. But it is when Christ died, after he came, he came to pave the way for the Spirit to fill us first and then come upon us. Hallelujah. So now we have a two way of the what? Manifestation of the Spirit. The infilling and the upon. So we are full of the Spirit and we are full of the power of the Spirit. So you have no excuse not to affect your generation. You have no excuse not to affect your society. You have no excuse not to transform, bring transformation to the darkness that is around you. Let me tell you something. Whenever you see something that is going on in your life, in your family members, or among your friends in your country, and there is anger in your spirit, it means God is giving you an assignment in that area. God wants you to rise up and fight that thing. If there is corruption, it means that God wants you to rise up against it. God is preparing you to confront that thing. If you see decadence, darkness in your family, it means that God wants you to bring light to the people in your family. If you are in a society where you see that people don't bring glory, it means that God wants you to what? Bring glory to those people. But you cannot be among them and bring glory unless, first of all, you receive a, a, a transformation. Hallelujah. If you are living in sorry to say, a shaman, and you buy a Lamborghini. People will, they, they will kill you. Hallelujah. So first of all, what you do is that you move to Trasaco or East Legon here, and then you buy the Lamborghini, then you go visit them. The Bible says in Acts chapter 7 that Moses, when he went and thought that the people would think God has sent him to liberate them, they didn't understand. That's what I mean by that scripture. So you can't be among the people and save them. So God said to Abraham, leave your father's house. Before I bring you to change them, I have to take you away from them. And then you will now come and save them. Somebody say, I'm a savior. So to anoint means to set apart, to rub with oil and consecrate. David knew about the anointing so much that, why? Because when, when you read the history of shepherds in Israel, when the animals had wounds, it is the anointing that they used in smearing over the wounds and it heals them. So he knew much about the anointing. That's why he was somebody who was always full of the anointing. Hallelujah. To anoint, okay, God bless you, means to set apart, to rub with oil, to consecrate. As the kings in the Old Testament, I think I didn't give you this one. Hallelujah. First Samuel chapter 15 verse 1. God sent Samuel to anoint Saul as king. 
So in the Old Testament, for kings to be anointed, they had to be set into an office. They needed to be anointed. For kings to be kings, they had to anoint you. If you were not anointed, you don't qualify to be a king. So God said to Elijah, since you are afraid to die, I will let you anoint Elisha as a prophet in your room. <laughs> you know what it means. It means that the assignment I've given you, since you are not finished it, I'm bringing somebody in your room. And then go and anoint Jehu as what? Somebody who will what? Wipe out the descendants of Ahab and his family. So, God, the assignment he gave him, Elijah couldn't do it, but Elisha sent a son of the prophet and he anointed Jehu. And he became what? A king. The moment the anointing came upon him, everybody that was around Jehu said, what did the prophet say to you? And he said, you know the manner of what? Communication and assignment. It means that they have anointed me as king. And everybody bowed down. God saved the king. Immediately, they recognized Jehu as a king. And Jehu started his mission. Then he went after what? Ahab's son. And he went after Jehoshaphat's descendants. And he started wiping everybody away. Because God has given him assignment. So in the Old Testament, for people to become kings, they needed the anointing. Somebody said the anointing. It is only now that our kings are selling our lands for Galamse. Because they came through man-made ways. But for God's way, in God's way. You know, God's plan was not for us to have precedence. You know it in the Bible. That's why Samuel was grieving. Because they saw kings. They saw the other nations having kings around them. So they said, we too want a king. And God said, since you want a king, it means you have rejected me. Why? Because I am the king of kings. I am the one who is your king. And since you want somebody in place of me, you have rejected me. So I can't communicate through judges to you again or through prophets to you again. Hallelujah. Are you with me? So like the priests of the Old Testament or priests of old, Exodus 28 verse 41, the priest, for somebody to be a priest, God said to Moses that anoint Aaron. Aaron is your brother. But you cannot just bring him into the ministry, but he has to be anointed. Anoint him and anoint his sons, Nadab and Abihu. Anoint them and Eliezer and Itama. He anointed all of them for them to become priests. And from that time, he became a president. So anybody that has to be a priest, you needed to be anointed. That's the second anointing. Hallelujah. And for you to come into what? The familyhood of God, you need the anointing. So God's intention from the beginning was to have a people who double with the anointing of kings and priests and which we are today. So when you check Exodus chapter 19 verse 6, let's read that one. Exodus 19 6. Revelation 1 6. You can write the scriptures down. Revelation 1 6, 5 and 10. 1 Peter 2 9. So in you shall be to me, or say, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. So what was God's intention? God's intention was to have a people that are anointed. A people that are kings and what? Priests together. That are a holy nation. So in what? 2 Peter, or is it 1 Peter 2, 9? He says, you are what? A chosen generation. But you are what? A chosen generation. A royal priesthood. A holy nation. His own special people. Somebody say, I'm special. That you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Your assignment is to proclaim his praises. Every child of God, your assignment is to preach the good news. So your field is your mission field. Your workplace is your mission field. So does that mean that when I enter into the office, I should start preaching the gospel? That's not what we are saying. In every nation, we teach how to connect. We teach how to make intentional discipleship. That is to make friends with Edwina. And then you keep on checking on her, inviting her, and having dinner or lunch or what? Supper with her. And then later on, when she has a problem, she tells you, then you offer solution. That is how she becomes a disciple among you. Hallelujah. Or with you. That is how you keep on increasing. 
That is intentional what? Discipleship. So at your workplace, when you befriend somebody, definitely they will tell you, once they look at you and they see the peace of God in your heart, the peace of God with you, around you, whenever they have challenges, they will come to you. They will share with you. And the next thing that you will do is to what? Tell them about Jesus. Tell them about the good news. Hallelujah. So the anointing help Jesus to be able to proclaim the good news. The first thing that he did was to proclaim what? The good news. So the anointing, as we saw in Jesus, we also saw in the early church, or we see it in the early church, Acts 1.8, Acts chapter 2, verse 1 to 4. The same spirit that was upon Jesus, you have that same spirit. In Romans chapter 8, verse 11, he says, If the spirit of him that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he will quicken your mortal body. It means that how Christ came back to life was by the spirit. And the spirit is within you. So if the spirit is within you, then nothing should be able to die in you. I declare over your body, nothing dies in your body. Let there be supernatural healing in the name of Jesus. Anything dead comes back to life in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. So it was the spirit that came upon the early church. When Jesus died, we all saw that they ran away. They were all afraid and they went to hide. But when the spirit came upon them, Peter stood among them and he started to proclaim the gospel. And he said, don't think we are drunk. This is early morning as, as, as at 9 a.m. Nobody can be drunk with wine at this time except by hangover. Hallelujah. But you can look at us that we are not drunk. But it is the spirit that has come upon us. And he proclaimed the gospel. And after proclaiming the gospel, what was the, the next thing the people said? What do we do? Hallelujah. When you have solution, when people hear good news from you, they know that you have answers to their problem. They will ask you, what do we do? Hallelujah. Are we together? So, the people, Jesus was full of the spirit. The early church or the people of old were, were also of what? The spirit. And we also see in history, we saw in history from the 1900s, the revival that broke in America. The Wales revival. I know of a man who offered, who was a nobleman, an Austrian, who gave his, 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 his wealth. His name is called what? Nicholas Ludwig von Zinzendorf. Hallelujah. The name is, I don't know whether it's a German name or what. Hallelujah. He was, he spearheaded the Moravian revival. When you, that's why I'm saying that you are a witness. If you have wealth, it means that God wants to use it as a means to reach out to other people. Jesus said, let your treasure Wherever your heart is, that's where your treasure is. And build your treasures in heaven. So I caught a revelation there. In heaven, material things are not needed. But you can use material things to gain a position in heaven. You don't understand it. <laughs> Hallelujah. You can use your finance to, to what? Propagate the gospel and build treasures in heaven. You can use your money to sponsor missions. You can use your wealth to sponsor the gospel, the establishing or building churches. When we went to Navrongo, what did Pastor Ivan say? He says there is a missionary here. All that he does is that he built church auditoriums for people. He left his country and he has come and hiding in that where me and you, we don't want to go. And that is where he's building church auditoriums for the Good News Church. So when they send a pastor in a village where there is only two people meeting under trees, the next thing he does is to build a small church auditorium for them. That is his mission. What is your mission? Where you are, it is not the final destination. You are just there as a means. That is why the work that we do on earth, they are temporary. That's why they fire you at times. So when you go there, take opportunity to let God be made manifest. Because God's intention is for all men to know him. To see his love. To, to hear about his good news. I said the other time, God will judge us based on the word that we have heard. Or based on his word. So if people have not heard, how does he judge them? And God is so humorous. And he's so, God is such a way that you can't escape it. 
He will make sure some way, somehow, you hear the good news. Hallelujah. Or oh, clap your hands for this God. So you can use your what? Your wealth. So somebody used his wealth to build a place for the Moravians who were running away from persecution. And they came there and morning and evening, they were offering prayers. They were praying and they started to do discipleship. And it was these same people that some moved from this area or from the United Kingdom and went to America. And it is through that place that um, David Livingston, all of them, came to Africa and brought the gospel. Adoniram Jusim, all of them who went to the uh, what do you call it? The native Indians in America and brought the gospel. It was as a result of what somebody invested in the United Kingdom or London. That's how they heard the gospel here. Hallelujah. William Carey went to what? India. Amika Michel also went to what? India. We saw go forth also in Chinese. It doesn't mean China has not had a revival before. They've had revival. But now it is a president who is there who doesn't want to have anything with what? God. But God said he will humble him this year. Hallelujah. Revival will break forth in China. Lift up your right hand. Declare over China that revival will break forth. Light will break forth over China. In the name of Jesus. People will hear the good news. In the name of Jesus. Pray for the Christians that are there. That God will strengthen them to be able to break through all barriers. In the name of Jesus Christ. We thank you Father. Hallelujah. So, we saw revival during the time of Charles Finney. Uh, when I was reading Charles Finney, at first when I hear about Charles Finney, when men of God are preaching, they say, Charles Finney brought revival. I thought he was just there and the Holy Ghost came upon him and then people started falling. No, Charles Finney had to do what me and you are doing ritually every day. He was praying. When he preaches and he realizes that he doesn't have effect on people, he goes into his closet and begins to cry unto God. What is the hindrance? Open their hearts so that they will hear the gospel. Let their hearts be open. Let there be revival. And their hearts got broken. He said one time he went into a factory where they were doing, they saw cotton. And a lady was sitting there. As he was coming, they knew him he, that he is a priest and he was coming. Two of them were gossiping. As they were gossiping, they were sewing. They were using their needle for needlework. All of a sudden, in the hands of one lady, the needle fell down. And she began to shake and she fell down. The one who was standing by also fell down. Before he realized, he has not spoken a word. All of them started falling down. And the owner of the factory came and he said, No, don't stop. We don't want you to go. Tell us, what do we do? When people see the power of God at work in you, they ask questions. What is the solution? What do we do? Hallelujah. What are you called to do? You are just passing on this earth to go. And when you get to heaven and you get back to your maker, what are you going to tell him? That I came on earth as a beauty fashionist or a beauty pungent. <laughs> Esther was a fashionist, but she used her position to deliver Israel. And then through her, revive us. Every, the Bible says that when the king gave a decree, said, what do you want me to do? And he said, reverse the decree of Haman. The Bible says that many people who were not Jews became Jews. That is revival. Hallelujah. Revival is when Shadrach and Mezak, they were arrested and put into the oven. The king said, nobody worship any other God except the God of these three people. That is revival. Revival is when they pulled Daniel from the lion's den. And then they realize that there's no God apart from this God. Hallelujah. Revival is me and you. When we enter into the mall, Accra Mall is a place where all, form, all kinds of people come to. When they know that we have come there, they shouldn't experience anything than the presence of God. Hallelujah. That is revival. They hear us worshiping and they are asking, what is going on there? What happened in Indonesia? I read a book by... The gentle breeze of Jesus. Go and read that book. Meltari. He said, the Holy Ghost broke upon a Presbyterian church. He was a Presbyterian. And they were worshipping. You know in Presby, you read the sermon from, we call it Amanak. So, Isaiah 61 verse 1. Introduction. Those God, so we are just reading it to you. Unlike the way we preach by the Holy Spirit. And then as they called one, one of the young men to come and lead prayer. All, what they saw is that there was a sound. 
in the room and he hit the auditorium, the place where only the priest prayed the prayer, everybody started to speak in tongues. And one man wanted to stop it before he realized he was on the ground. The power of God has broken through the place. And the power of God came upon them. And Metari said, after that day, they realized that they have to go into the hinterlands. They, some of them met lions. They met pythons. He said, one of the testimonies that I love is that, he said, in places where they are going and they realize that there are dangerous animals, they are going and the animals are just watching them and wagging their tails. It means that the presence of God, people are moving by the power of the spirit. There was a time that it was raining and they were going to a far place. As it was raining, they didn't use anything to cover themselves. The rain was falling around them and they were walking in the path and the path was dry. The power of God is real. Hallelujah. If me and you, our heart can be stirred, we can cry to God for revival to set up his fire in us. We will bring change to our, our society. People will see us. People who are in darkness will come to light. Hallelujah. We are not forcing them, but they will see the evidence in our lives. The apostles didn't go and force people to come into the body. They saw the power of God at work in the lives of the apostles. They saw what God could do, what God was doing, and they were added to the church. Hallelujah. We know of Titus Kwan. Have you heard that name before? In Hawaii. But you know the Hawaiian revival. You don't know of uh, Betsy Stockton. All of them, Azusa, we know that the revival that broke through them, it was men who yielded themselves to the Holy Spirit to use them. Say, Holy Spirit, I yield myself to you. Hallelujah. So, the anointing came upon Jesus. He was first anointed. The next thing he did was to preach the gospel. So, the anointing enables us to, number one, preach the gospel boldly, like Jesus did. Acts 1, 8 and 38. So this is the word in our mouths, Isaiah 59 verse 21. When you read Isaiah 59, you realize that Isaiah was now crying that the Lord is not deaf and neither is his hand short. It's because of your sin that has hindered him. If there is something or a reason why God cannot bring revival is the hindrances of men or sin. And sin beclouds the hearts of men. And the Bible says that if our gospel be hid, it is hidden to them that are blind, whom Satan, the God of this world, has blinded their eyes so that the, the light of the glorious gospel should not shine on them. So the devil keeps men in darkness. He keeps people in bondage so that they will not hear. Hallelujah. Are we together? Somebody say, I need a revival, Lord. Revive me in prayer. Revive me in the study of the world. Revive me in search for souls. In Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. So he went on doing good. Jesus went on to do good. When he was anointed, he went on to do good. He became philanthropic. So you can become philanthropic without the Holy Ghost. But it is us. You, you know something. God saw the heart of this man, Cornelius, in Acts chapter 10. He says, your arms and your prayers have become a memorial before me. So those who are doing philanthropical work, if only they will accept Christ. Ah, hallelujah. It's not that some of them, they have not heard the gospel. You can do philanthropic work, but if you are without the Holy Ghost, you can't have treasure in heaven. But if you do it and having Christ, you have a treasure in heaven. You have a place in heaven. You have a, a, a glory, a crown in heaven. Hallelujah. So the anointing, or by the anointing, we heal the brokenhearted. Psalm 147 verse 3, we heal the brokenhearted. Isaiah 57 verse 15, we heal the brokenhearted by the anointing. Somebody can face broken heart. His or her girlfriend or boyfriend can leave them. You can't mend their heart. It's already broken. It's the only the anointing that can mend that heart. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to Jesus. No, it, there are some healings. It's only God who can heal. There is an extent to which man can what? Help you. But with God, there's no limit. Number two, we proclaim liberty to the captive. So as we proclaim the word that is in our mouths, people are liberated from darkness. As I'm speaking now, somebody that has been in darkness is hearing light. 
as we always stand here, Pastor Lord always stand here to preach the gospel. You hear the gospel and what comes to you? Liberation. When you are in darkness, when a man is in darkness, what they need is what? Liberation. So by the proclamation of the gospel, liberty comes to people who are under captivity. That's why I said in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3 to 4, if the gospel is hidden, it is hidden to them that the devil has blinded their eyes. That they shouldn't hear. Number four, we proclaim freedom to prisoners. So as you proclaim to people, whatever kept them in prison, they are liberated from it. Are we together? Isaiah 42 verse 7. Isaiah 42 verse 7. Number five, by the anointing, we proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. That is jubilee. The acceptable year of the Lord is jubilee. Leviticus 25 verse 10. This is the year that God said to Israel, if somebody came to borrow from you during that year, debt is cancelled. If somebody was a slave under you that year, let the person go. So, when people hear the good news, that's why Jesus said, he that the son set free is what? Free indeed. So, Jubilee has now become a person. Hallelujah. We have a day, but now it's a person. So as we hear the gospel, they are liberated from slavery. As people hear the gospel, darkness leaves them alone. That's why the devil, the greatest form of warfare is evangelism. The warfare we do by prayer is good. But the greatest one is evangelism. When you are snatching people from hell, you are snatching people from darkness. When the devil knows, he will come after you. That's why I give an example that if we don't pray for our brothers and sisters always. There are people that, you know, our Nongopo, they can send you to pay. Hallelujah. But God is with us. And the Bible says that God encamp around what? Jerusalem. As the Lord is around the mountains of Jerusalem, so he is it around the, the, what? the righteous. Hallelujah. So during Jubilee, there is emancipation. As there is emancipation, there is also restoration. So as we proclaim the gospel, there is liberty, there is freedom from darkness, from darkness, and from what? Prison. People are emancipated from slavery, spiritually, and they are restored to their sonship. Listen to me. This is heavy. All, all men on earth are God's creation, but not all are his children. Are we together? In John 1 verse 12, he says, them that believed in him, them that what? Believed. He gave them the right to become the sons of God. So until you are believed, you are still a creation, but you are not part of the sonship. Let's move on. Hallelujah. So there is a day for vengeance. God is going to judge men. He's going to judge men based on what? What they have heard. Based on Christ. Christ is the yastic for judgment. Hallelujah. So we are to go and proclaim the gospel. So if we don't proclaim, people will not hear. What people need to hear is that God has already done the work in his son. He has finished it. That is what they need to hear. Every man on earth, the price for salvation on their head has been paid. But ignorance is keeping them in bondage. So until somebody hears the gospel, they will be in bondage. But once they hear, it's just like Pastor Lord will say to me, Pastor Duma, go to Accra Mall. I bought so and so and so gift for you. Until I go there, it is not mine. But when I get there and I refer to him, that is the claim. I'm coming to claim that. So when I get there and say, this so and so says that he has bought this and paid for this price, they will give it to me. The devil can test your sonship, can test your identity to know whether you really, what you claim you have or what you claim it is, whether it is really true. Hallelujah. So in Zion, we are, we are in Zion as saviors to go and proclaim liberty to people. We are the saviors that God is counting on to go and bring people from darkness. Hallelujah. The proclaiming of the gospel brings comfort to those who mourn. When people are mourning, they begin to hear and they begin to hear the gospel. The mourning disappears. When we read the scripture, he said he, he, to bring what? Comfort to them that mourn. Because of time, I'm running. Hallelujah. So what is the resultant effect of the anointing? We see salvation. Number one, 
salvation from sin, it comes by the proclaiming of what? The gospel. So as people hear the gospel, they are saved from sin. They are delivered. They are healed. If they need healing. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Number two, what follows is transformation. So he says, they become oaks of righteousness and they go about building the old ruins. They become plantings of what? Righteousness. Somebody say, I have been planted in the family of Zion. Hallelujah. So we have become plantings of the Lord as we disciple them into what? Maturity. So it doesn't end there. People saw revival upon revival and it never continued. You know, when God begins a revival, it is a move. But we need to know how to transform or translate it into a movement so that it will continue. Hallelujah. And that is why we do discipleship. So I see this, my brother. I preach the gospel to him. He accepts. And then what I do is to teach him. And then he also goes further to bring other people from what? Darkness into light. So the cycle keeps on continuing. Hallelujah. But when we, we end it there, we are enjoying the glory. We are enjoying, you know, when I was reading the book of um, God's Generals this year, I enjoyed when I was reading the Azusa Revival. When some people had, there were animals, pests eating their crops, what they do is that they will all go to the farm and then they declare to the creatures, don't eat the animal, uh, what do you call it, the plants again, and all the pests will flee away. People carried power. When the animals are sick, they lay hands on them. They pray for them. And they are healed. How much more human beings? But upon all, where did the revival end? Some people went there from Africa and brought the revival to South Africa and to different parts of Africa. Some went there and took it to Asia. But now, where is this revival? It's because there was no... Or structure that was not put in place and everything was centered on one man and so when the man died revival ended hallelujah so we become plantings of righteousness so as we experience revival we help other people also experience revival and they also go and bring other people and it continues hallelujah then third thing is that glorification so as we receive the anointing, we get anointed by the Spirit and we proclaim the gospel, glorification begins to happen. So God receives glory and people begin to glorify also in you. Hallelujah. So in, in the New Testament, the believer can share the glory of God with him. Hallelujah. God's glory is seen in you. As people are seeing the wonders God has done, maybe somebody is a drug addict. And God saves the person. The next thing is when they look at you, ah, how is your life so beautiful? Your life has become so glorious. And then they begin to talk about your life. And then the next thing is that, oh, praise be to God because only God can do it. So now you and God are sharing glory. Number four, reformation or revival or resurgence. Somebody say revival. So they will build the ancient ruins and restore former dissolutions. Cities and communities are renewed and generations are impacted. The cycle of discipleship continues and the discipled filled with the Spirit will lead the revival. The one who is discipled and is filled with the Spirit is the person that leads the revival. Hallelujah. So this is how personally communities and nations can be transformed. It starts from what? We being filled of the Spirit. We having the Spirit anointing coming upon us or the empowerment of the Holy Spirit and we go to proclaim the gospel. Glory to Jesus. So when we are singing, Holy Spirit, fill us. We are not just, it's not, it's not just theory. You have to mean it. It is something you are desiring from God. Please rise up on your feet. <laughs>